All right, so since this is the last talk, you guys have to pretend you're really excited. So anything I do, just go overboard. Right? I like this guy already. So exactly. So I cut a lot of the slide drop because I know most of you are very familiar with Docker. So I'm not going to talk too much about containers in general, um, but I will talk about uh, what I consider the future of operating systems. All right. All right, so really quick, some people actually don't know what an operating system is. Um, some people think um, the Linux distro is the operating system, but I want to be really clear here that we're talking about the lower level parts of it, like the Linux kernel, and basically the scope of the Linux kernel is what I'm referring to here when we talk about the operating system. The user line that you get from your distro, um, I consider that a little bit separate. So just to reframe everyone's thinking here is that an operating system manages the hardware, software resources, and provides common services for applications. Right? So this is the way we describe a single machine. And I think this will fundamentally change, and we'll go through the presentation to kind of find out why. All right, and another thing is um, the systems we use, mainly like Linux, uh, are time-sharing systems. So we can have multiple tasks running on a single server, and we use the scheduler built into our kernel to schedule those tasks to specific CPUs, right? So I ask a lot of people, have you ever used a scheduler before and no one raises their hand? If you're using Linux at all, you're definitely using a scheduler. And Linux's job is to effectively use those resources on our single system. So here's where things start to change. So currently, the Linux distros uh, provide us an OS and a curated set of shared libraries. Um, maybe 10, 15 years ago, this was really, really awesome. How many people have ever installed software using like make, make install, right? That is a terrible thing to do, right? Because you don't know where things go. It's like a shotgun blast all over your servers. And you, most of them don't have a way to even uninstall that stuff, right? So you would just have to restart your system and start over. So having those shared libraries made that a lot simpler. Once people started writing more applications, then you started to have a lot more conflicts. So the need for shared libraries, most of us have been spending the last couple of years working around this idea. System Ruby, don't touch it, right? Because you may want to build an application with a different set of libraries. Depending on your local OS, might become problematic for, this, for you. So this is where Docker disrupts this. So Docker allows us to bring our own dependencies with us. Over time, if you look at it, you stop using the shared libraries on your local system. This starts to federate the Linux distro. Now it isn't about Red Hat versus Debian. Now it's just that you bring your dependencies with you. You need very little from the OS other than maybe shared kernel and maybe something like Docker to run your particular container. So now we're moving into a row where the OS will be federated. You will get your dependencies and services from random parts of the internet. That's probably a drawback in most cases. <coughs> All right, so init systems are completely outdated and will be replaced by remote APIs, right? So a lot of people got excited with systemd. Some people quit their job because of systemd. <laughs> um, but systemd, I think the ideas behind systemd would have been great a decade ago, right? But no one likes this idea of logging onto a server, making a unit file, putting it in the right place, and running commands on a local command line. That is a terrible way of going about things. And the bad part about that is there's really no great APIs for systemd. There's dbus, but it's archaic to use. And most people now um, have proven that they prefer something like what Docker offers, right? A remote API where you can launch applications and query the state of the system. All right, so what's going to force this change? Um, it's this idea that was coined a while ago is that the data center is the computer. But in order to use it, it will require a distributed operating system, right? So putting Debian across a multiple machines doesn't really work out well. You can put Debian on single machines. Maybe you can put Debian on a switch. But the API that Debian gives you out of the box is not good enough for this new world of having the data center become the computer. Now, most people will say Docker solves all their problems. Two years ago, people were running in circles saying Docker, Docker, Docker. How many people are running Docker in production right now? All right, half of you are probably lying, um, but the other half that is telling the truth, my bet is that you built a bunch of tooling to run Docker production. Show of hands if this is true. Right, and the reason why you did this is because Docker provides maybe one-tenth of the solution to what you need, right? So this idea of bringing our applications with us is awesome. It gives us some contract between my laptop and testing and production but that's only one-tenth of your solution. What about service discovery? Logs, metrics? Uh, what happens when the server goes down? 
So people are still running around in circles, waking up in the middle of the night to resolve containers that are no longer running. We really haven't moved the ball forward, but we do have a key piece to build on top of. So this is what Docker allows. So what is a distributed operating system? So a distributed operating system is a OS that will manage a group of distinct machines or computers, right? This could be switches, this would be storage arrays, um, random pizza boxes that are on your network. So now we have to think a little bit differently. What do you need from a distributed operating system, right? You need a lot of other tools, you need some other facilities, and you really want really good APIs so we can build new tools on top. So one mistake I think people make when they hear about things like Kubernetes, which I'm about, what I'm about to introduce, is they think Kubernetes will be like a Heroku replacement, right? But the thing is, Kubernetes is a little bit lower than that, right? It's a distributed OS that we stretch across multiple machines to provide this new set of um, abstractions and resources that sits on top of Docker. Now, what I'm going to do is attempt a series of live demos to really bring this point home. What does this distributed operating system need to feel like in terms of workflow? So everyone here understands the Docker workflow, right? Build your application however you want push it to a repository. So now that we have this collection of applications, we need a way uh, to deal with them. So the first thing I want to tackle head on is state, right? When most people show these systems, they will never show a database running on the system, right? Because it's like, well, we just don't do state, right? Everyone has 12 factor apps, but that isn't true. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna try to tackle state up front. So the first thing we want in a distributed operating system is that I can't rely on a single host for my data. Does it make sense? It kind of defeats the purpose. If I start attaching this to the local system and the host goes down, my data's gone. So I like this idea of network attached storage. Depending on your network, it's fast enough for many workloads, and I'm hoping that it improves over time. So the first thing we want to do is have a disk. So I'm going to do this on GCE. So this should work anywhere um, you have network attached storage. If you're in your own data center, you should be able to use things like NFS or iSCSI. So what I'm gonna do is list my network disk just to make sure I have a disk for MySQL. All right, so MySQL is a non-cluster aware database. So the problem with MySQL is that if you wanna manage it in a highly available um, form, you're going to have to build tooling around it. None of these tools can compensate for the lack of your application being cluster unaware, but we can make some things a little bit better. So what we want to do is now that we have this disk, I want to describe to the system that I would like an instance of MySQL running. So the system I'm going to use as my distributed operating system is Kubernetes. So what I have here is a MySQL replication controller. And the purpose of a replication controller instead of just a bare container is that I want a babysitter watching this particular container. So when I launch this container, I want to give my declaration to the cluster and make the cluster responsible for keeping MySQL up and running. Very similar to what you get from System D when you tell System D to always restart your application on a single machine, we're going to stretch this concept across the cluster. Now we're going to give it a template using a standard MySQL image. I'm doing the craziest thing in the world here. I'm putting my password in a file. Don't check that into GitHub. All right. The next thing I'm going to do is refer to this volume. Right? So the volume I created earlier is this MySQL data uh, network attached disk, and I'm going to refer to it and bind mount it to my container. Now I'm going to let the scheduler figure out how to deal with this on its own. Find the best host to run MySQL. Once you find that host, attach this volume, get it in place, format it if you need to, and start the container with the volume in place. Okay? So what we'll do now is I'm going to use the Kubernetes command line tool. I could use curl and submit this through the API, but kubectl makes it a bit easier. So what I'll do here is I'm going to create the MySQL replication controller. So now the controller is created, but we don't necessarily have a container. The controller's job is to review the cluster state and guarantee that at least one instance of MySQL is running. So what it will do is find out there are none, and we can list our pods now, and we'll see that one gets created for us. So right now we're in this pending state. So MySQL is being, um, right now we're, our scheduler is looking for a home for MySQL. Once it finds one, it will go through the steps of attaching the persistent disk. All right, so now it's up and running. Now, I don't know where the server's running, the service is running, but we do know that it's going to run on one of these three machines, right? But I don't really care, right? My distributed operating system is taking care of this for me. 
So at this point, MySQL should be running. Now, I do want to communicate to MySQL. It has its own private IP address, so how can I do this? Well, one thing I would like from my distributed operating system, it should be able to give me network connections to things that it's running. So we can do this with kubectl. So we're going to get the name of the pod, which is holding our container. So kubectl, what I want to do is port forward to this particular container or pod. I'm going to use container and pod interchangeable since I'm only running one container per pod. And then I want to port forward 3306, OK? So if this works, we now have a connection to wherever MySQL is running in the cluster. Now what I want to do is log into it to make sure that it actually works. So we'll log in. How many people know what my password is? And it's like, guy, like, he's trying to hack into it now, but you don't know the IP, so it's not going to work. All right. So now I'm logged into MySQL somewhere in my cluster. So the next step is I want to put some data in there. Right? So this is where it gets scary for most of these tools. They tend to just gobble up your data and go away like MongoDB used to do. So what we want to do here is I'm going to import um, some SQL files. So here we have a collection of files that will create our database table. So here's one of the files. We're just going to create a simple table that holds all the speakers' first and last names. So we'll source this file. Come on. All right, so now we have a table in place. All right, let's see if we have any data from speakers. All right, so we don't have any data, and what we'll do now is we'll source um, the SQL statements that will insert the speaker. All right, so let's see where that is. All right, so now here's all the speakers. Oh, look, Unicode works. I was thinking that my database would explode and catch on fire with Unicode, but it didn't. Well, let's see if that survives. OK, so now we have our list of speakers. So at this point, we actually have state in the database. All right. So now, here's the part where um, you're looking for a new job. And what do you do on the way out? You delete the database. Right? <laughs> you don't tell anyone what you're doing. You just say, you know what? F all you guys. I quit. Now, the database is gone. OK, so now you're in a bit of trouble here. Um, so now the database has been deleted. Um, we don't really know what state we're in. Um, we do know that some things aren't going to work like that. Right? So now this is when people start waking up at night, pages go off, people run in circles. So what do we expect our distributed operating system to do? Right? Our intention was to always run MySQL with that specific volume. If things are working correctly, it should bring it back. So kubectl, git pods. We see that we have a new container. Um, it's probably running on another machine. It's going to go through its scheduling process. It may get a new IP address. I'm not really concerned with that. I'm trusting that this thing will come back. Please come back, because that will look probably really silly. <laughs> it just doesn't work. All right, so let's see. So it says it's running. And what we need to do now is port forward again. And you guys have to make noise if this works. Remember, get us kicked out of here. All right, so we do port forward. All right, so we are connected to a database process, another container running, we're back. You guys make me feel so good, thank you. <laughs> All right, so that's, that's my SQL. So this idea of taking the storage away from individual machines allow us to truly decouple from one individual server, and now we have this idea of floating applications along with their state. If you wanted to do like MySQL replication, we could have two of these processes with their own independent disks and doing replication in between and relying on the cluster to do the same things we saw earlier if there were any node failures. So the next thing that I see people do or have problems with with just a container is configuration files. This is where most people are just doing some crazy things that have put us back maybe 10 years of how we do things. So most people take a container and build another container with a configuration file in it. This is madness, right? So for every environment that you have, you have one of these new containers with weird names, like, oh, this is Redis for production for tomorrow or maybe next week. It gets ridiculous really fast because this is not the intention for these things. But without a good distributed operating system, we have no way of doing this. So just like the volume, imagine if we can have another uh, mechanism that we can specify a configuration and have the scheduler bind mount the configuration just in time. So let's try this with Redis. 
So we have this Redis configuration file. It's huge, okay? And what I want to do is make some adjustments to this configuration file. I don't know what most of this stuff does, but I'm sure if we turn this off, it'll be fine. Um, 10, 12 sounds like a solid number. <laughs> All right, so now we have this configuration file. So one thing that Kubernetes provides to us is this concept of secrets, right? So I can take this configuration file and shove it as one atomic secret. The way people use secrets today are one secret per value username, password. The problem with this is that if you change the password and you automatically restart your app, you could be going too soon because whether you need the new username before you need to do this. So most people treat the config file as an, an atomic transaction of all the key values required for that particular app. So no matter how we generate this configuration file, we still can push it in as a secret and refer to it later. So what we want to do now is I have a little tool that I've written that's called comp to cube and in order to speak to Kubernetes, we have to compose an object. So we need to create a secret and give it to Kubernetes. So what I want to do here is I'm going to take this Redis configuration file, and I'm going to format it in a way that we can give it to Kubernetes. One of the main things we have to do is basically before I code the contents. So I run this command, and we get one big-ass <laughs> configuration file. We're not going to even look at it. We just trust that it's the right thing. So what we want to do now is give it to Kubernetes. And most of the Kubernetes tooling is kind of built with the Unix philosophy. So we can run this command again, and we can pipe it to kubectl. And we can say create-f, and then take our output from, our input from standard in. So here we go. So now we should end up with the Redis secret in place. So if I say kubectl get secrets, S-E-C-E-R-T-S. -E <laughs> what, what happened? What is it? I'm just saying you guys are paying attention. All right, so we have our secrets here, and there's our Redis.com secrets. And it's an opaque secret, and it's 29 seconds old. But how do I get it back, right? So if I want to get it back, I can refer to it by name. And what we can do is output it in JSON format. Again, this is pretty much incomprehensible because it's written in uh, as base 64 encoded. So what I can do is pipe it to kub or comp to kub. And what we can do is extract the secret and we get our configuration file back, right? So we're able to store this as a secret and refer to it later, right? So this is really good for multiple people working on this stuff. So now let's take a look at the Redis pod that utilizes this. So this looks very similar, except for I'm not using a babysitter, just a pod itself. The important lines to remember here is that I'm just using a standard Redis image from the Docker Hub, two arguments, the Redis server, and the configuration file. That configuration file does not exist in the container um, by default. But what I can do is I can refer to a new secret type. So here I want to refer to a secret called redis.conf and give it a name of redis-conf. And then I want to bind out the contents of that secret at that path, right? So this gives me a way to ensure that the right config file shows up. So kubectl create dash f redis pod. All right, so now we go through our scheduling event loop to find the right host for this Redis uh, container. All right, so I said it's already running. That was pretty fast. So that means it's up and running somewhere. Now, one thing I want to do is verify the contents of that configuration file. But again, I do not want to log into a single server. It kind of defeats the purpose. So what I want to be able to do is do things like uh, run ls in that container somewhere that it's running. I expect that my distributed OS will do this for me. So kubectl, uh, what I want to do is exec the command. And I want to run an exec inside of this Redis pod. And the command I want to run will just do, let's make sure it's there, user local etsy. All right, so we see that our file is there. And what we can do is now we can cat the file. Now this is perfect when you need to troubleshoot one of your particular containers without trying to figure out what server you need to log into. All right? So there's the content of our particular configuration file. So the nice thing about this in the Kubernetes world, we believe that everything should be able to be done from outside of the cluster. If you ever have to log in to do anything, to look at logs, for example, um, you should never have to log into a server to do it. So what we can do is look at the logs for this particular um, container. right? If we wanted to, we can also tell these logs for anything that comes out of it. So 
This is the idea that this operating system is completely distributed. We add new nodes, they all become eligible to run future workloads. All right, so that's Redis. So now that we have this way of managing configuration files in state, the next thing people want to do is to scale and manage multiple copies of their containers. So what we're going to do now is we're going to stop using these declaration files. So what we've been running today are these declaration files that we give the Kubernetes and then enforce the state. That's a huge hurdle for learning for most people. You should be happy to know we can do most of this on the command line without ever writing any of these state files. So what we can do now is we're going to start by running Nginx, right? Simple enough. So we do kubectl run Nginx, and I want to use a specific Nginx image. How many people just use latest all the time? Shame on you, sir. <laughs> mean, like what version is it? I don't know, use the latest one. All right, so I'm going to use version 179. Hopefully that version actually assists. Let me make sure. Um, let's see. 178. Oh, nine. It's there. Cool. So we'll use it. And then what I want to do is make sure that we expose port 80 across the cluster. So every container in this pool will get its own IP address. Therefore, they all can bind to port 80 if they so choose. Um, so now we're going to be running Nginx. And we're going to use this particular image on port 80. And I'm going to give it a set of labels. So this will make it easy for me to discover things later, and we'll see how this works. So one of the labels I'm going to give is app equals nginx. The other label that I'm going to give is a track called stable. So this is the stable version of the application. All right? Everything looks right. So what will happen is, from running that command, it will give me a babysitter by default. We consider this best practice. So now that I have this nginx babysitter, I should get one copy of nginx version 179, um, with these labels on it, right? So if I do kubectl git pods, we'll see that we have one of our versions of Nginx already running. Now, let's verify that this actually works. We can actually expose this to the public internet. So earlier I was using port 40, which only works on my laptop, but the whole goal here is I'm gonna run these microservices, I want to expose them to the world. So what we do is have integration with load balancers, right? So what we can do now is do kubectl expose Replication controller called Nginx, and the type that I want is a load balancer. Now we could do no port, so if you don't have a fancy load balancer that we can integrate with and call remote APIs, we can expose a high port on the individual servers, so that way you can use a traditional load balancer just to proxy to the individual servers. But in this case, I'm going to use the Google integration. This also works on Amazon. So now that we've exposed Nginx, um, we have the ability to hit it remotely. So one thing I want you to pay attention to, because labels are a very important concept in this particular system. So if I get all the services in the systems, especially the one we just created, we have Nginx and we're waiting for our public IP to show up. But while we're waiting, I'm going to describe Nginx. So the service, Nginx, you'll notice we only have one endpoint here, right? So that's the container that's running current. <laughs> Now, if I want more of these, kubectl, I can scale the replication controller, nginx, and give it a new replica set, let's say three. And what will happen is the whole system is reactive. All of this state that I'm changing is in the central place, so anything that's concerned with state of these objects will respond in near real time. So if I describe nginx again, once those pods become healthy, you'll see that they automatically show up in our low balancer. And we also have our public IP for our load balancer, right? So I want to verify that this actually works. So what I'll do is do curl-si so we can see some headers, HTTP. So what we want to do now is we want to hit this Nginx instance. Why is this not working? Are the demo guys out of my favor? This cannot be. We never lose. We won't lose. All right, so now we have Nginx. Yes, clap. <laughs> Loss was imminent. All right, so let's verify the version of Nginx really quick. All right, good. So now we have Nginx 1.7 running. 
So now we have the ability to scale in and out. So one thing I want to do is show you that we can also scale without dropping traffic while a lot of things are being rearranged automatically behind the scenes. So what I'm going to do is going to run this in a for loop. Wow, true, do this, uh, sleep. How many people use sleeps all the time? Yeah, I'm like, he did it like this, yes. <laughs> I do it too. Sleeps are great. All right, so now we have Nginx, um, and we're hitting it. So one thing we can do is continue to scale this thing out without disruption. All right, so we'll go to five. Um, that's pretty easy. So only the healthy pods are added to the back end. And of course, this, you know, one um, request per second is easy. So what we'll do is we'll try to crash our server here. So we have a nice little command called boom. <laughs> How many of you have used boom before? If you haven't, just run it in production and watch all, <laughs> watch all your monitoring tools light up like a Christmas tree. It's hilarious when it happens. I'm my fault, man. All right, so what we'll do is we'll get the service IP. We're going to try this. So, uh, how many people, how many, how many requests do you think we will drop when we try to scale this? Because this never works, right? Okay. Hundred. All right, we'll drop a hundred. So we'll do ten thousand of these, um, and then we'll do one hundred concurrently. So we'll run this, and let's see if we can scale. Let's go down to two. Uh, we change our mind back to five. Okay, let's see how many pods we have. All right, so things are running around being changed, and let's see what's happening here. So we don't drop any of these connections, and this is almost done. I'm pretty sure we're going to get kicked off of Wi-Fi because I'm effectively dosing it right now. Um, <laughs> but it should finish soon. All right, so it looks like most things finish pretty fast, as even though we're moving things up and down, and all requests, all of them, came back with 200. Right? So the load balancer behind the scenes is smart enough never to add a pod until it's actually healthy. We consider the life cycle of the pod before we add it to the back end. Same thing when we remove them. We remove them and we make sure no requests um, get tried again. All right, so now that we have that, the next thing you want to do is upgrade. Right? Now, how many people trust their developers? Or if you're developers, how many people trust themselves? <laughs> The guy back there, I trust myself, okay? I don't. So if I was your ops person, I would totally not believe you. You say, hey, I want you to deploy the new version of the app. So one pattern I like to use is the canary pattern. How many people have ever used the canary pattern before? All right, it's pretty awesome. So great, a couple people here. So the idea of the canary pattern is that I will deploy a small percentage of my environment with a new app. If it blows up, I will delete it and pretend it never happened, okay? <laughs> so this is what we do. So the idea here is that I want traffic to go to both sides. And the way we're going to do this is we need to use a common set of labels, and I'll show you how this works in a moment. So we'll do our run command again. So we'll run nginx, and this time I'm going to call it canary. And we want to run the new version of, in, of nginx. So developer, what version should we run? 197. Sweet. All right. And this time, instead of the track being stable, I'm going to make the track canary. All right. So now we're going to run this. All right, what do you think will happen now? What is the percentage of the assignment? Let's see. All right, do we see our canary in the output? Now let's make sure that it's actually running. Cool CTL, get pods. All right, so we have this canary. It is up and running. And do we see it anywhere? Does, does anyone see it come up? Where do you specify the percentage that you know, that many know should be? Ah, so percentage wise, what we should have is a mix. So we have one to five now, so there's five of the other ones and one of the new ones. What we hope to happen is that, well, let's verify this really quick. CTL get services. So we have the service, and what I want to do now is describe it. Nginx. So what should happen is that I should see a total of six of these backends. So one, two, three, four. So there's five total back here. So that means our particular thing didn't get picked up, and I know why. So the reason why I didn't get picked up is when I created this expose, I exposed it only to a specific replication controller. So what we can do now is kubectl 
we're going to delete our service called Nginx. I could have created a new one not to cause my monitoring system to go crazy. So what will happen is now that will be deleted. So what we want to do is have a load balancer that actually profit, profit, uh, proxies traffic to both individual replication controllers based on a subset of their labels. So if I say kubectl get pods, we see them all. If I shorten this list to labels that have app equals nginx, we see that we only get the nginx pods. If we shorten this again to uh, track equals stable, we only get the stable ones. And if we do track equals canary, we only get the canary one. So let's redo our expose command again. So when we expose this, what we can do now is add a selector. We want to expose traffic for app equals nginx, OK? So this would be a little bit more um, less restrictive. Anybody, any container that has app equals nginx will get picked up by this load balancer. So kubectl get svc. All right, so now we're waiting for a public IP address to show up. Stop that. All right. We have this nice little watch command that will give me feedback on when any state changes. Oh, let's make sure that this gets picked up, actually. All right, so we describe Nginx, and we see a total of six. So we know the label was able to catch the other replication controller. So now, if this works, once we get our public IP address, we'll be able to, or we should be able to, to find our canary while it's running. This is the point of awkward silence. <laughs> so do we have to delete the service like that? So we could have patched it in place. You could have created it that way by default, knowing that you want to use the canary pattern going forward. So there's no real reason to delete it other than show you that you, know, you could. So now that I have this IP address, what I'm going to do is use it to loop over. And what we should see is our canary somewhere at some point. All right, so now we have a canary. You don't quite trust your developer here. <laughs> so what you want to do is you need to try this again just to make sure everything is, is good. Now, at some point, you may want to have a specific controller just for new customers to see the new version. And you can imagine what you need to do, right? You can just expose. You can expose the canary. And we need to use a, another subset of labels. In this case, we'll just inherit the labels from that particular controller. So I'm going to create one just for my canary. So now you have two services side by side, right? And it's up to you to use them how you see fit. And again, we'll wait uh, for our public IP to show up. Okay. So this seems to work. We see our canary coming through. And while we're waiting for this public IP to show up, the next thing you want to do once you're happy with the results of the canary is you want to roll it across the cluster. But again, we have no idea where things are. And we expect that our distributed operating system will handle the work for us. So what we want to do is tell it, go find all the existing um, containers under a specific replication controller and roll them to the new version. But do it in a way where we don't drop any connections, OK? Now this is the part, oh, let's see if this works. So ideally for that customer's complaining that I only want the new version, we have the ability to do that as well. So we have this new. Um, service that's mapping to a specific set of labels. And now we should only ever see the canary, right? Because we're only finding those pods dynamically. Go away. All right, so now we're back. All right, cool. So now we want to roll this. All right, so the way we do that is we can use this rolling update command. So here what we want to say is that for the Nginx replication controller, I want you to go find all the pods and kill them in a way that they go away and get replaced automatically. So we run this rolling update command. So now we go from, we're going to take the existing replication controller for Nginx and scale it from 5 down to 0, one by one, while simultaneously taking a temporary contain, uh, controller and scaling it up. And while that's happening, we should start to see more 1.7, 197 um, versions of Nginx show up in our output. 
And we're, just for kicks, I don't know if this will actually work. We're going to do it anyway. We're going to see if we can complete this without dropping anything as we roll to the new version, scaling things up and down. And we don't want any drops here. All right, let's see how far along are we. So we're down to two on one side, three on the other. So we have a couple more to go. We might time this just right. <coughs> this is when, how many people think this will actually work? <laughs> That's not a lot of confidence. <laughs> it's, like, <laughs> it's like four people. Damn, okay. So it looks like 197 is completely through. Oh, we have some pauses, so this is good, we recover. So we're, we're down to one, and what should actually happen at this point, we're scaling the other one up to five, we're going to scale the original one down to zero, and then we're going to swap the names, that way I can do this rolling update again in the future if I need to, right? It helps with automation. So now this is complete, we'll rename, and once the rename is complete, we'll go back to the other side to see what state we're in. And we see 197 across the board, and we don't see, hopefully, no dropped responses. Works. All right, so the final thing before we wrap up, this one I'm going to need people to help me with. I don't, I'm not sure if you guys have your laptops open. Maybe iPhones will be able to do it too, we'll see. Um, so it's nice to be able to manually scale these up and down. But it'd be much nicer if we were able to use CPU metrics to scale this force automatically. So I have a component called Thrasher. So Thrasher um, is just the worst web service ever. You hit it, and it tries to compute the square root um, between, what is that, like one million, right? So it would definitely tear up your CPU in a hurry. Um, so what we want to do here is I'm going to launch a new service called Thrasher. But this time, we're going to put an autoscaler in place and allow the distributed OS to manage the scale for us, okay? And to get load really high, once I create a service, you're going to try to hit it to see if we can trigger it to scale up. Um, most people have not been successful in doing this. We'll see if you can pull it off. All right, so what we'll do now is we'll run Thrasher. All righty, let's... Uh, where's my Thrasher? Okay, so here's Thrasher. So we're going to do kubectl run again, and we're going to use an image from the Google Container Registry. We're going to have this thing listed on port 80. So I create Thrasher, and I'm going to remove these other pods. So we have all these pods running right now, Git pods. We don't need them to be there because they're going to cause a bit of confusion for us because we can't see any output. So I'm going to delete the replication controllers that back them. All right, so this is a cascading delete. If I delete the replication controller, that also deletes all the pods for us automatically. You can control if you want to do that or not. So how many pods we have now, oh, yeah, they're terminating, will be, I think, MySQL, but here's Thrasher, okay? So now the idea here is that we have one of them running. I'm going to put an autoscaler in place that will adjust the number of containers based on the load. So let's do the autoscale. So I'm going to say the minimum of one, max 10, CPU, I don't know, I'm going to bump that to 20%. So the goal here is to try to get the single container to use more than 20% of the CPU of that it's been allocated to trigger an automatic scale-up of the pods. So I'm going to put the scaler in place, and now I'm going to expose Thrasher. So we expose Thrasher, um, and then I'm going to do type equals low bouncer, so we can get a public IP. All right, so you guys are going to attempt to send out enough load. I doubt you can, um, but there are people here that may know how to do such a thing. All right, so the public IP is going to come up. I wonder who's going to claim victory on this one. All right, so here's Thrasher. We're waiting for a public IP. Let me delete these so you don't DOS these other load balancers by mistake. All right, delete, SBC, Nginx. Nginx Canary, all right, so those are gone. You can't DOS those by mistake. All right, so we're waiting for Thrasher to show up. So once you see it pop up on the screen, go ahead and try to make it scale. 
What tools are you using to do this, by the way? How many people are just like, refresh button? All right, so there's the IP address. All right, try to make it scale. So apparently, you guys suck pretty bad. Um, we're at 0% here. If you're a hacker, you should probably get another job. Um, so can we get to at least above 20%? <laughs> really? No, I don't know. I'm not getting anything. You're not, you're not getting anything back? Connection resets. Connection reset? Oh, I got an OK. You got an OK. All right. Oh, in your web browser. Yeah. Yeah, so once you uh, actually compute the square root, you end up getting back. Wow. That's broken. I think you really, uh, bring it. they're not going to let you come back here next year. All right, I got an OK too. So at some point here, we're going to basically aggregate the CPU over time for the amount of CPU allocated to this particular pod. And what we should see here is an update um, in the next minute or so. So every couple of minutes, we aggregate the sum of CPU usage, and we'll see that number go up. And we should see the autoresponder respond. Oh, so you guys have done it. Let's see if it worked. And how many do we have? We have three. You guys need to do better. 46%. All right, here, I'm going to help you guys. Where's my boom? There we go. I'll give it, I'll give it a run. Let's see. You guys, you guys are literally hitting the refresh button. There's tools for this. You guys are using tools? Ah. Forty-six percent. The Wi-Fi can't handle it anymore. All right, stop it. I'll, I'll let, let's do this. Oh, this is painfully slow. All right, some people have given up on the endeavor. I shall achieve. What? <laughs> let's see if we can do this. All right, I want to see ten. All right, you guys just stop because you guys are basically throwing rocks at a gunfight. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll handle this one. Man, I think Go is just too efficient. I should have wrote this in Ruby. <laughs> <laughs> the first request would have just went through the roof. All right, all right, everyone stop. And I think mine will finish, and it should get the load high enough uh, to complete this particular task. Wow, this is a really efficient program. <laughs> If you all wrote software like this, we would all have no jobs. I, th I think the code is too good. <laughs> Has everyone stopped? There's a thing called Control C. Yes. <laughs> stop it. All right, let's see what we get. I want to stop mine. Woo! 858%. Let's see if it works. We don't need more than 10? I think that's the best it's going to do. I just write too good of software. <laughs> so it, it did scale from one or from from one to three automatic. Oh, there we go. So now this thing is getting sad. <laughs> and it said uh, it wanted to respond to this traffic, so now it's went crazy. Oh shit. <laughs> now we have all ten. Just run boom and a pot and also scale that. That'll be Yes it would have. So now we have ten to respond to all the traffic. And with that, I'd like to end the presentation. Thank you.
Any questions? This was all recorded, by the way. Or look real. <laughs> Ah, so the question that was when I did the kubectl run nginx, so by default the run command creates a um, replication controller using the specification that you put on the command line. So if you do kubectl run dash help, you'll see all the things you can pass it. So everything that I put in those files, most of it you can just specify on the command line as an argument or give it your own JSON file if you want. And then we just create a replication controller by default. That means I explained it well. <laughs> All right, with that, thank you.